Well, uh, we uh, we are now going to do the, the, the discussion part. We're very happy, Cassia and I are very happy to have here a group of lady and gentlemen, uh, expert on everything, all things Brazil. And uh, the way this is going to work, and we sort of agreed that uh, uh, Cassia and I will alternate here asking each of them one question for them to make their initial remarks, and then we will open for mm -hmm. discussion, okay? Uh, and uh, you have uh, the announcement. I will not read the bios. Uh, uh, they are here, starting uh, on my left, uh, Roberto Simon, uh, among other qualities, has had an association with the Estado de São Paulo. He was a reporter, that's a, that's a good man. Uh, he uh, is now working on uh, a consulting firm here, uh, not in New York, uh, and uh, uh, is actually owe us a book, right, that he is finishing. He owe us a book, he was a scholar here, and he Part of the book was uh, worked on here, so uh, we'll have him back, and the topic has nothing to do with it. But uh, then we have Mauricio Moura, uh, who has uh, been with us many times, making political analysis of the context in Brazil. Monica De Bol, also a dear friend. Murilo de Aragão, uh, who is speaking here, I think, for the first time. But I'm ass I can assure you, he knows uh, his stuff. He is also from a consulting firm, a professor, uh, uh, recently, most recently, an adjunct professor at <coughs> uh, Columbia, at the, the program there. Uh, Ricardo Mendes from Prospectiva Internacional, also an other dear friend. And uh, so, uh, with that, do you want to add something, ma'am? Uh, no, I'm here to bring gender balance with Monica. No, but delighted to have such a <laughs> such a great panel of specialists. And uh, please shed some light on what we can expect on the political economic scenario for Brazil in the uh, upcoming year. <laughs> yeah, I will ask you to speak from where you are, and uh, I will start directing my first question to. Mauricio, Mauricio ha does a lot of research, uh, uh, polling, and uh, I would like, Mauricio, you to uh, focus on one topic. Mauricio worked <coughs> very closely until recently, I don't think it's a secret, uh, with uh, Luciano Huck, who considered uh, seriously launching a political career and decided not do it, at least not now, but is a person that is very interested in promoting renewal of the political class in Brazil, new names, is, has associated himself with uh, certain movements. And my first question, Mauricio, obviously you can answer my first question in 30 seconds and say whatever you want in <laughs> other eight or nine. Uh, do you expect those new actors, given the level of rejection according to your own book of established political leaders. <coughs> Do you expect uh, those new movements, new actors, to uh, mark a presence, to be an important factor in this uh, period ahead, the campaign for president, governor, senator, state assembly, federal, uh, Camara dos Deputados? Oh, good morning. Thank you, Paulo. Thank you, Wilson Center, for, for the invitation. Um, I will begin my my minutes here saying that I strongly agree with the uh, with the governor when he said that people are looking for an outsider in this election. I remember we did a survey in 2014, four years ago, and it, we, we asked it uh, in a national survey, uh, "What's your desire to vote for someone uh, outside of politics for an outsider?" And in 2014, even after the protests, the number was 25% of the voters. And uh, we did this same question uh, last month, and the number today is 56% people uh, 
l l willingness to vote for an outsider and uh, w and also uh, coming from governor's comment what's what means an outsider and we asked that question and the most important factor to an outsider is not to be involved in corruption scandals uh, the most important characteristic is to be honest so honesty and transparency would be something that would differentiate the candidates in all levels uh, from the presidency to the state level so that's uh, for example uh, one question that we did and we asked it what are the main attribute for the new president uh, 42 percent were related to honesty to transparency it should not be involved in corruption five percent were related to experience so so it's uh, I think the, the key factor for the outsider is to be out of the corruption scandals, is to be honest. And that's uh, something that this election, and I think this is the legacy of the car wash Lava Jato operation that uh, the people that can show that are not part of this would be uh, gaining a lot of ground on, on, on the election. Uh, having said that, uh, I think there is a big difference what's going to happen in the the state and presidential election compared to the to the Congress. And I will start with the the presidential election. In our view, and I think uh, all the polls that are public are go, go to the same line. It's going to be a much more unpredictable race compared to the to the other elections. I do agree that polarization is an in a weakest moment since 1994 so there there is very l it's a likely and real scenario to don't have the pt for example in the second round and of course the governor alchemy will have to work hard to be in the second round so there is very likely that pt and pscb are not going to be in the second round that, that they were since 2002 that's a very likely scenario as of today and uh and sometimes w we 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 ask the question uh, if the PT, P PMDB, now MDB and PSDB are are the same, and 65% of the people consider that the three of parties look like the same, so they say that they are all corrupt, and they are they are all involved in in the corruption scandal. So this is going to be tough for them, and they're going to have to work hard to show that their candidates are out of this uh, corruption circle. Um, so I see. Uh, in the presidential election and also the state's elections are room that we didn't have in 2014 because even after what happened in 2013 in Brazil all the protests or the movements uh, we didn't see a uh, really change in the election especially the majority elections in my personal opinion the only big change that we had in Brazil in 2014 was in Maranhão that uh, the the group of Sarnais was was defeated by the P communist party so that but was after 50 years in power in Maranhão, but in, in other states, the majority of the states were like a like a continuity, and so I see this time a much more changing environment compared to four years ago, and that will reflect on the elections in presidential elections. So we have more candidates outside the the main the big political parties. We're going to have some state at, at state level some potential surprises. I think the most unpredictable election state-wise would be Rio. Could you guys imagine that Bernardinho and Romário could be the next <laughs> governor of, of... Imagine if you were in the, in the late 80s. So who's going to be the governor of Rio? Romário and from soccer and Bernardinho from volleyball. So that's, and that's a possible scenario today. So, so we, we, there's a room for, for outsiders in the state level as well. Um, so and and even and even so this is the majority elections the big parties are going to have a lot of hard time to 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 tackle this election on the congress especially i'm going to talk in the national congress one thing that uh, we do have space for those new civic movements i see i think it, we have a, a a greater bigger space compared to like four years ago uh, but i have to tell you that many senior politicians coming from the senate coming from state governments are going to be uh, candidates for, for the National Congress. Uh, some people claim that because of the, they have a privileged forum uh, uh, for in terms of justice, 
Some people claim that uh, they are doing for the, the stake of the party to, to guarantee that all the, these big parties are going to have people on the Congress and guarantee uh, public funding for the parties, space on TV in the next elections. But anyhow, we're going to have a lot of senior, senior politicians that have votes, that have been senators, that have been governors running for Congress. And that's also, it's, it's tough for newcomers. On top of that, there is a demography change in Brazil that is changing election after election. And we see from the surveys that we do, a lot of uh, candidates relate to evangelical parties and more conservative movements are gaining ground. So I see this in, in polling. Uh, but having said that, we are going to see uh, new people, regular folks, new citizens, people from coming from those movements being elected. The question is how, how big would that be? I don't think it's going to be very big. Uh, uh, we're talking about one third of the Congress that is in play for, for those kind of candidates in our estimates. But I think it's more relevant that would be compared to four years ago. So, uh, and just to, to complement, I strongly agree when the government said this election uh, in all levels, especially the presidential election, are going to be centered in three main pillars, in my opinion. First one, it's public security. And, and the current president made a big favor for that topic after the Rio intervention. So this is going to be public uh, violence, security are going to be not only a discussion in the state level, but also in the presidential campaign. And a big discussion. It's not only about only the economy this time, in my opinion. Second one was, uh, is this corruption side. Uh, a lot of discussion going to be held, and the voters are going to demand that to understand how people relate with corruption scandal, how honest is the candidate. And it's going to be a, a big discussion. And the third one, of course, and it's not my, it's, it's the economy. All presidential elections relate to the economy in one sense. But this time, economy is not going to be the only player uh, in town. Thank you, Mauricio. Um, <coughs> actually, uh, following up on that comment, the comments you just made, I would like to ask Monica. Uh, just a few days ago, former President Fernando Henrique Cardoso mentioned that whoever is the candidate for the financial market will not win the election, right? So how much of the election will actually be about the economy. I mean, I understand all the social issues that Mauricio just raised, but people also need jobs, right? Um, so how much of the, uh, the economy will come into play into this election? Thank you, Cassia. Um, thank you, Paulo, for having me back here. Um, I feel like I'm here, you know, constantly these days. Um, let me move like this. Um, I do have one chart to show, but before I show that one chart, let me get to um, Cassia's, Cassia's question and the issue of, you know, the, the market candidate or the, the so-called, you know, candidate that would be supported by the markets and um, former President uh, uh, Fernando Henrique Cardoso's opinion about that. I broadly share that view, um, and I'm in agreement with it for two reasons. A, there's currently this... Um, there's currently this debate in Brazil, which will sound very old here in the U.S., but it seems to be new in Brazil for some reason, which is a debate about how big the state should be. And there's a certain camp, um, and, and certainly Bolsonaro and, and there are other um, candidates in that camp, but he's the, he's the flag bearer for that, who have been arguing for you know the so-called Estado Minimo, which basically means very, very small state. So you know restrict the state as much as you can, privatize everything. And in a country like Brazil that is that big, that complex, um, this sort of discussion really leads nowhere because, of course, the question on people's minds when, you know, somebody comes out with a statement about the size of the state and mm -hmm. it, it becoming ever, ever smaller. Yes, the Brazilian state's big. There has to be a reform of the state. But talking about, you know, this sort of thing in a, in a, in, in a country that is so unequal 
and where there's so much heterogeneity is really not going to ring very well with the public at large because people will interpret this as, okay, so there aren't going to be any more social programs um, and there aren't going to be, you know, a, a number of things that are still needed in the country even if they need to be done better and they need to be done more efficiently. So this is, I think, one point to keep in mind. The second point to keep in mind is the is the question of the economic recovery and whether the economy is an issue or not an issue. Um, of course, as an economist, I'm always going to say that the economy is an issue. Um, but more than that, it is an issue because when you look at the recovery, as the governor was saying, Brazil had posted growth in GDP of 1% last year, which doesn't sound, you know, very sort of... Um, earth shattering in any way. But of course, this is coming off of a two year recession, a very deep recession where income per capita in Brazil fell by about 10% on those two years. So, you know, having some growth last year is certainly hopeful um, for the future, but it's not nearly, nearly enough to change sentiment on the ground. And I think the, the one indicator that really speaks to that is unemployment, and not just unemployment, but what's happening to the labor market at large. So unemployment in Brazil is still at 12.2%, which is very, very high. It's come off from the, hot, from the peak of nearly 14% some two years ago. That's a good thing. But it still means that there are millions and millions of Brazilians that continue to be unemployed. And not only that, the jobs that have come back are actually fair, fair fairly precarious jobs. So they're jobs that, you know, are, are either temporary or not altogether formal. Um, so, you know, they leave people with this sense of lack of, of, of security, lack of economic security, which is certainly going to play a part in the elections alongside the many other issues that Mauricio mentioned. So any candidate that is playing up the recovery or playing up these issues about the size of the state and so on are not going to reverberate very well with the Brazilian population at this point. And this is irrespective of the fact that, you know, yes, having a big state as we do in Brazil does lend, you know, the, it does lend itself to corruption. We've seen corruption associated with that. So all of this push towards, you know, just having a, a smaller state also has to do with the corruption fight. But again, it's a heterogeneous country. It's a country that, that has a very high rate of income inequality still. So you can't do away with many social programs and you simply can't have that kind of debate simply doesn't resonate. Um, let me move to another point just so that I don't talk my, for my full allotted seven, eight minutes. Um, I just wanted to show this chart. So this is the this is the one thing that I'm very concerned about, and that Mauricio mentioned in his in his comments when he talked about the legislative election. election. So moving a little bit away from the presidential elections and more into what kind of Congress we might see after the October ele elections in 2018. This is a chart that basically shows Brazil compared to other countries in Latin America. You have on the vertical axis the debt to GDP ratio. On the horizontal axis, you have an index of political fragmentation that's widely used in um, the political science literature. Th these, are these are Latin American countries here, and I've signaled a few. So you can see Mexico right there in the middle. You can see Colombia a bit farther to the right. And look at where Brazil is. Brazil is a complete outlier. So it is the country with the highest level of legislative fragmentation or political fragmentation in Congress, and it also happens to be the country with the highest debt to GDP ratio. These two things are not spurious correlations. They're, it, the debt is high because of political fragmentation, because of everything that has to be done in order to govern. Um, in Brazil. So if we look at the coming elections now from the legislative side, and if we have a sense that political fragmentation is not going to diminish, it might not get worse, but if it's not going to diminish, then the, really the chances of bringing down this debt ratio and doing all of the reforms that Brazil needs to do to get out of its really dire fiscal situation don't look that bright. 
Um, and this is something, you know, to, to, to really keep in mind. So moving a little bit beyond the actual elections and moving a little bit beyond, you know, the candidates and who might win and so on and so forth, I think we really need to be concerned about the level of fragmentation that the country is still going to have and whether that fragmentation is going to be a substantial obstacle to having the reforms that the governor was talking about just a while ago. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. I would like to direct the third questions to Ricardo Mendes. Uh, and uh, it has actually to do with our speaker <coughs> of this morning. Uh, Ricardo Mendes and his partner, Ricardo Senes from Perspectiva, have been uh, insisting that, uh, and this comes from 2015 and 16, that. Uh, uh, Geraldo Alckmin uh, will eventually emerge as a very strong candidate for the presidency. And this is before lots of <laughs> things happen. And I, I found this very interesting, that capacity to f see this. Yes, he's the governor of Sao Paulo. Uh, Mauricio gave us information, and we know that, uh, well, polls uh, are not very uh, uh, favorable but right now. Uh, to uh, the governor of Sao Paulo, but uh, at the same time, polls are never uh, a good predictor uh, this far out before elections. <laughs> uh, nevertheless, I would like to ask you, uh, where did you get this kind of, this level of confidence in predicting that Alckmin uh, will be a major player given everything we know in terms of resistance to established politicians, the impopularity of his party, and all the rest. Please. Okay. Well, thank you, Paulo. Thank you for the invitation to be here. It's really, really a pleasure to be back here. It has, has been a while since I, since I last came here to speak. So, yes, we understand uh, that the strength of the establishment in Brazil is, is, is very important. Is very very important. It's something that we need to take into account. We understand that there is a lot of uh, pressure for renewal. There is a lot of pressure for uh, something new. There is uh, a lot. We we do see a lot of uh, outsiders emerging as important candidates or pre-candidates to the election. But uh, we we have to take into account that Brazil has a very well established. Uh, um, uh, electoral machine, which is which is difficult to be, uh, at least for now. We, we do think that changes will come. There will be a time when more and more of what we, we, we're, we're seeing, this pressure that is coming from the people will be taking into account. It will reshape the political system. But as it is now, we think that uh, the, the strength of the establishment is still much, uh, much more important than this pressure for renewal. Okay, so how do we see this? We think that there, there are four factors that actually influence votes in Brazil. Okay, first one of them being uh, campaign resources. Okay, and when I say campaign resources, of course, it means funding for campaigns. It means television time. It means radio time. Okay, which is uh, free in Brazil. It's uh, distributed according to the representation that parties have. Um, in the in the chamber, okay. Um, so uh, this year we're going to have uh, uh, there's going to be a short campaign, as the governor said. We're going to have 45 days of campaigns, and for the first time we're going to have presidential elections or general elections for governor, as, as the governor also explained, without private funding for the campaigns. So the candidates will have to rely a lot on public funding. Okay, the electoral fund that will be made available for all the parties. Even the smaller parties will be getting a share of this fund, but it will be, it will be distributed according to the representation, ma majorly distributed according to the representation they have in the lower house. Okay. So we're talking about roughly 1.7 billion Brazilian reais, and a small party will be getting a very small share of this money. Okay. Um, Small uh, candidates that don't have a strong representation in Congress or have no representation at all in Congress will have virtually no television time. 
they will not have the space to make themselves known, to advertise their ideas. Okay? And more importantly, I think on, on top of all this, we have the electoral machine at state municipal level as well. So all of this makes it very, very important and makes a, a, a candidate in Brazil to be competitive, has to build alliances, has to build strong coalitions. And we don't see any other, uh, the governor has been doing this even before he was elected governor for the last time. He has been building uh, this coalitions. He has been forging alliances, thinking of running for, for office in, in 2018. So we do think that he's a very competitive candidate. We don't see any other uh, candidate in any political spectrum right now uh, with the possibility of, as he explained, narrowing down as much support to a single candidature as he has. Okay, no other, no, 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 no other names that are currently running or that are currently campaigning has this potential to bring big important parties that take a significant part of these resources that will be given to the parties, saying MDB, former PMDB, now MDB, the PP, okay, the um, PSD, PR, the Democrats. This is so. We, we this is the we would say the most important uh, factor that we have to consider in a, in a national election like Brazil. Second um, thing that we have to take into account is the voters' behavior. Okay, so overwhelmingly, Brazilians support the center. Eighty percent of Brazilians support. They say they identify themselves as being center leftist to the center right. So. There is only 20% of support to radical candidates. So we don't see someone like Bolsonaro being that competitive in an election. Okay? They will find uh, the cap he'll find it when he's running, when he's actually campaigning, will be not much higher than what he has now. This is what, what we expect. Third important factor in a campaign is the attributes of the candidates. This is, I'm talking about the charisma of the candidates. It's, this is often... Uh, people say that this is one of the liabilities that Governor Alckmin has when he's running a national election, and it is for a fact. But if we see the polls that came out yesterday, we will see that out of the candidates, uh, out of the, the people that were interviewed who are familiar, who, uh, who say they know who the candidates are, Alckmin rejection level is only um, lower than Bolsonaro's. Okay, so he's not, he's, he's, he's not the most charismatic person, he's not, but this is just one of the factors in a campaign. And even, even if we take that factor into account, we think that he's, he, can, he can still be competitive. Okay. And of course, the fourth uh, factor is the economic context. I think this is very important. Uh, if, we, if, we had, if a national campaign had taken place two years ago instead of this year, maybe the game could have been different. I think with the economy growing as little as it is, with the perspective keep continuous growth this year, this will change the mood a little. It will kind of make, uh, there will be less, uh, less appetite for anti-establishment vote in Brazil. So that's in a nutshell why we think uh, okay. Governor Alckmin is a competitive candidate. Thank you, Ricardo. Uh, speaking of the polls that came out yesterday, Roberto, and now I'm going to turn to you for this question. Um, Bolsonaro um, is in second position with voters' intention, and depending on the scenario, if you take out former President Lula, he leads, actually, in, the, in some scenarios. Um, do you think that Bolsonaro has the capacity to sustain this uh, support base? when the political machines of the PT, PSDB come into play during the actual elections? Can he sustain his lead? Well, good morning. Um, thank you so much for the invitation, Paulo Cassi. It's great to be here, to be back at the Wilson Center. Um, I'll start by saying that certainly the winds of populism are raging everywhere, right? We've seen in Italy this weekend, um, Brexit, Trump, I think it's the story in all um, campaigns we have this year in, in Latin America. Um, and, you know, inevitably in Washington or New York, people are looking at Brazil and thinking, what about Bolsonaro? And b basically my argument would be that Bolsonaro meets the definition of what analysts call, you know, a fat tail risk. I think he's unlikely to win. 
uh, at this point. Um, however, given the enormous impact that a Bolsonaro presidency would have in the policy outlook of Brazil, macroeconomic stability, the severe deterioration of democracy in Brazil, it should be taken very seriously. Um, and, I mean, we can think about scenarios where, you know, a Bolsonaro candidacy gets stronger. Um, for instance, if we have, let's say, Rodrigo Maia, uh, Meirelles, Alckmin, Marina Silva, you could, you know, potentially crowd out a viable center-right, center, right, center um, candidacy and open way to a Bolsonaro polarization with someone from the left like Ciro or, or Lula himself. Uh, or you could have, you know, a potential runoff between Bolsonaro and Alckmin. And if Bolsonaro manages to shape the narrative and convert the runoff into a, a, a sort of a referendum on political elites in Brazil and the political establishment, I think things get really dangerous at this point. Right. Uh, but it's interesting because your question flirts with another question that I think is the question of these elections. And to put it shortly is how different this election will be from all the elections we had, the presidential elections we had in Brazil since 1994, right? Um, and there is a lot of pressure over their system in the sense that, you know, car wash has, has you know, tremendous impacts on the political establishment. A protracted uh, recovery after uh, a very difficult recession. Uh, there is an anti-establishment feeling in Brazil that is very strong. Um, but at the same time, it's interesting when we look back to the to the to the presidential elections we had since 1994, we see that despite the fact that Brazil has you know 25, 28 parties in Congress, um, usually these disputes have been very stable. And by stable, I mean they have usually two big phases. The, fa the first phase is chaotic and, you know, a lot of volatility and noise. Uh, but then when you move closer to, to the election, meaning by late August or early September, kind of the system kicks in. So what, we, what Ricardo was saying, you know, the fact that you have big parties, etc., cetera, um, usually tended to a polarization between the center left and the center right, of course, the PT versus the PSDB. Um, I think, and b by the way, uh, uh, Governor Geraldo Alckmin mentioned this. I think at this point, Brazilians are much more focused on the World Cup than on the presidential elections, and they will remain so until late July, the World, World Cup and in, in mid uh, July. And I will go back to what Ricardo mentioned in terms of why the system was so stable in many ways. And of course, the fact that you needed these tremendous uh, party machines. Uh, with a lot of capillarity and power at the local level, support from mayors, governors was essential to, to sustain the system in the sense like in the United States, all politics is local. In Brazil, you needed mayors um, advancing your candidacy, etc. You need a lot of money. And this goes back to the point that this will be the first election, presidential election, when big companies cannot donate money, uh, although individuals can. Uh, and of course, the allocation of resources is, uh, reflects the size of parties in Congress. Uh, and then you had the third factor, which is media exposure, right? We always TV time and, and radio time has been an issue in Brazil. Uh, uh, and it, it, again, it, it reflects the size of your coalition uh, in Congress. I would argue that all these three elements are under duress or in dire straits in Brazil, right? If we think about big parties because of car wash, um, I mean, they are in deep trouble. Uh, let's think about the PT, for instance. If you compare the local elections that we had in 2016 for mayors and uh, city councilmen to the election that we had in uh, 2012, the number of PT candidates decreased by 50%. Um, the parties in their straits, it's much more isolated when you look at the coalitions that PT is forming, and it's much more radical than it was before. But even to go back to, to Governor uh, Alckmin, his party is also in, in, in big trouble, I think. Um, it doesn't have a strong presence in, in states like Rio or, or Minas Gerais. In Rio, it remains to be seen what happens with Eduardo Paes. In Minas Gerais, the party has basically to convince 
Anastasia to run. Uh, and even in Sao Paulo, which has been kind of the bastion of the party, um, Doria is not the rock star that he used to be, you know, six or eight months ago. And then you have the PMDB, much more fragmented, always very fragmented, but now you have, you know, people uh, like from Rena Calheiros to, to, uh, to, I don't know, Meirelles will be the candidate. So it's, I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble uh, imagining that parties will be super strong. The second part of campaign financing, for me, it's a big question because, in fact, we won't have uh, campaign donations. But going back to Bolsonaro, what, how will the kind of the evangelical uh, or new Pentecostal uh, money flow to his campaign? And will this kind of balance uh, the fact that he has a very tiny coalition? And for me, it's remained to be seen, right? And the third element, which is media exposure, I would argue that both TV time and radio time uh, are much less relevant now than they were before. And I, I'll, I'll reference a, a, a very interesting survey that IDEA Big Data did, and you correct me the numbers if, I, <laughs> if I'm wrong. But uh, so in 2008, at the height of the campaign, um, so the TV advertising had two, 22 points in the Mbappe, meaning that it would reach 22% of the Brazilian population. In 2016, from 22, it went to 6% in 2016. Now, 70% um, of Brazilians communicate via WhatsApp. Uh, I was looking at an interesting FGV um, study about um, fake news, etc., and they found out that in the 2014 presidential elections, 10% of the political conversation online was triggered by bots or fake profiles. Uh, this creates a new environment, and again, I don't think at this point that Bolsonaro is likely to win. But if we are to tell the story of a Bolsonaro victory in November, and I definitely hope we're not, but if we are, I think we'll see a systemic failure of these three levels uh, leading to a newcomer. Um, well, the final question will go to Murilo de Aragão. Murilo, the... <laughs> yes, that's the question, but it's... Uh, uh, former President Lula got uh, obviously a negative decision yesterday at the Court of Appeals in Brazil, which regards uh, it's a, uh, not immediately, it doesn't have an immediate impact, but the decision was that uh, the interpretation of the Supreme Court about uh, uh, when a convicted felon goes to jail is after a court of appeals decide, etc. Well, uh, it looks like there's enough enormous pressure now too for the Supreme Court in Brazil to review its own decision on this uh, because uh, there is a new movement there, justices switching sides, and uh, they could uh, reconsider that decision and uh, meaning that the former president that is now uh, found guilty of uh, two types of crimes, uh, well, who would go to jail? Maybe not. But there is this uh, apparently more established uh, 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 jurisprudence on his eligibility <coughs> because as a uh, 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 he would be part of the. He he would not. Uh, he would be affected by the clean record law, saying that he's ineligible. This by the electoral tribunal, not by the Supreme Court. Putting all that together, in the case that President Lula is not able to run, which is most analysts seems to believe is the case now. That's the most likely scenario that he will not be on the ballot. What impact would that have in the general picture? Uh, who, where his votes uh, would go? What would he be his impact if he decides to campaign for this candidate against that candidate? And please enlighten us on that one. In, in that simple question, <laughs> probably the most horrible question was directed for me, no problem. Uh, I believe that, first of all, I believe that uh, Lula will be not candidate. 
and 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 what and because the law is very clear uh and uh, and uh, allegations recently made by Luis Fuchs the president of the electoral court is that the clean record law will be strictly implemented so it will be very difficult to accept that Lula will be candidate but this is not the end of the question because actually Lula knows that he will be not candidate, but he wants to extend his agony to the limit to permit two things. The first one, to, to make his narrative of victim of the system strong, and second, to increase his capacity to transfer his votes to some candidate, to another candidate. So actually, Lula is much more doing a kind of PR comp uh, campaign than an electoral campaign. He knows that he will be not a candidate. But he wants also to create a, a, a problem to the, to the authorities of the electoral system, uh, forcing uh, his uh, candidacy until the last minute, even having a convention, approving his name, and then when they have to, to, uh, to ratify the convention in the electoral court, the, uh, the electoral court will, will reject, will deny, then he will do an appeal inside the electoral court. It, it will be rejected, then he will do another appeal to the uh, Supreme Court to, to stand his agony and to show to the world that he is victim of the system. He's a political uh, person that is being uh, hunted uh, by the system who wants to impede him to return to power. The problem is uh, Lula has the majority of the votes today in the preferences, some 30%. Uh, I believe that this will be not uh, 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 kept until the election because today he is uh, enjoying the, the, the phenomenon of the recall. So the recall of his name, the recall he, what he did, and also because uh, Brazil, uh, Brazilian establishment is divided about the government, about the, go the, the economy, about the Lava Jato. So all this division uh, 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 gives to him enough ground to progress and to establish a good position in terms of recall. But I do not believe he will sustain this uh, when we have the campaign more uh, uh, in the streets. Uh, I agree with what Ricardo said. Uh, we we ha have to know that this campaign will be totally different from the others. Uh, first of all, the new rules. There's a cap of spending, which is very different from the past. For example, what Dilma spent with his marketing guy, 75 million reais officially, uh, will be the total budget for the campaign for president this year. So. Can you imagine what she expend in, in her campaign, in the marketing guy, will be the total amount of money that one candidate can use today. The second point, we have uh, uh, the no uh, business donations, uh, which is very, very important. So the third, the parties will be very important because they will have money. So it is, a, is an advantage for the, gr the, for the big parties. So Bolsonaro has a problem with this. Marina and others will have no money to do the campaign. Uh, f the fourth aspect, for the first time, this, the government will have a lot of money to do campaign, this government. Even with fiscal constraints, uh, the government is very rich. The machinery of the government is very powerful. I... I, 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 I consider that the government, the federal government itself, has 5 to 8 percent of the votes if they choose one candidate. So it's something that we have to consider in the, in the, in the campaign. Uh, the other aspect is the effect of the intervention. The intervention, the federal intervention in Rio de Janeiro, created a new a kind of black swan in the campaign. It was an, uh, an expected event uh, and uh, reaching uh, the core of the preoccupations of many Brazilians. As Mauricio said, you know, today uh, public security is an issue. Uh, so the, the success or failure of the intervention is something that can change uh, the, the preference of the people, especially when you have a guy like Lula that will be not candidate. And, and every week, 
uh, more people that are choosing him as a candidate will know that his candidacy is not for real. So this is something that people will know that. Uh, as close we are from the election, people will be more aware about the election. I do not agree with uh, Governor Alckmin about the World Cup because, you know, Brazil changed. I remember when I was uh, a kid, uh, I was eagerly waiting the Christmas, you know, three months before, four months before. The carnival was something that everybody was longing for the carnival three, four months before. Today, the events are just like that, you know, one day... You wake up and then there's carnival. So there's no more time to long for events. So there are, nobody's longing for the World Cup and nobody's longing for the, for the election so far. So today, most of the research, so the, the polls are just based in, you know, people want to, to give an answer, you know. And it's the easier answer is to say Lula, Bolsonaro, because it's the names that are around. But in the end of the race, uh, the structure, party structure, as Ricardo said, the government structure, as I said, uh, and the, the power of the government, and also the fact that Brazilians are not radical people, they will like to, to live around the center, will point to a situation where the majority of the votes of Lula will go to some kind of guy uh, that could represent this. And, and the conventional wisdom points to Geraldo Alckmin. What is the problem? to finalize, the conventional wisdom pointed for Hillary Clinton here. <laughs> so we have to be very careful about conventional wisdom because always shit happens and then a surprise <laughs> can <laughs> appear as a black swan. Thank you. It is the first time that that expression was used. Yeah, I think what that Woodrow I, Wilson was very yes. annoyed with me no, now. No, 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 it was used before, yes, because that thing does happen. But <laughs> it, uh, uh, dear, uh, we are now going to start uh, a conversation here. I don't know if you guys have comments to make on each other's remarks. Uh, go, Maurice. I do have a, I do have a com, uh, I do have a comment. Uh, I, uh, I hope, uh, Ricardo is right. <laughs> and I think he's much more popular in financial markets saying that than myself, uh, because I, I was. I did a lot of political campaigns inside the political campaign. The TV and radio, like uh, Roberto was saying, is losing a lot of ground in political campaigns. I have doing every cycle; it's less useful, it's less powerful. I, I don't think people don't want to see politicians, and having more airtime of a politician sometimes doesn't help. Sometimes it's better to have 30 seconds, uh, because people don't want to see a lot of politicians in a. I, th I think Alberto is right. The WhatsApp is going to play a major role in political campaign. Uh, nobody understands how how to deal with that. There's a lot of room to fake news, to spread fake news in a very short uh, time and a very focused also. Um, I think there is a... I, I strongly agree with them that party infrastructure is very important. What I, f what I see from the parties that I talk is that they're going to be... Uh, very occupied, uh, very busy, uh, trying to elect their, their major people for the Congress. Because it's imagine today if uh, someone from a big party locks in your door to talk how build is to vote for PT, for PNDB, for PSDB, they're going to have to work much harder with the voters this time, much harder. So that, that so, but but uh, again, and the last point. Um, that I, that, I, that I want to consider is that the center, I always talk about Brazilians, I, I strongly agree, they're not radical people, but the center has been destroyed in every election globally. You see in Europe, you see here, you see Italy, Germany, Portugal, Spain. So, and that's one something that the social media has produced. So social media has produced a lot of uh, noise in the radical parties, radical, and what scares me the most about Bolsonaro and Roberto is that I hear people that now Bolsonaro is a liberal in the economy. Now he's like, uh, ah, we can we can work with the, his crazy thoughts about behavior if he runs the economy. So now he has a University of Chicago guy. So he's be trying to become center. So my question, yeah, my, my, my final point is, this is a completely different election. So 
if you if you if you think that putting more politicians in more time on TV will help, uh, I don't know. I'm talking to the wrong people on the ground. So. <laughs> Monica, I, can I add a comment? Yes, Muril and then Monica. Okay, ab about the, the, the social networks, it's really important to understand that for the first time, uh, the social media will be more important than the normal media. And this is not only a question of figures besides the, the like you said about WhatsApp, but for example, uh, Facebook has more than 120 million accounts in Brazil. So. Uh, will be uh, a, a very important tool to push uh, the candidates. But uh, 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 who has the money? The money is the big parties. So the, s the, the small parties, Bolsonaro, will have to collect a lot of money to impair uh, a social uh, uh, media campaign uh, as made by the other candidates. So this is a point. The second point is trend that the, the center is dis being destroyed in, the, in these countries. For sure, uh, can happen in Brazil. But in Brazil, the rules to newcomers are very strict. Different from Italy, different from Spain, where Podemos could be created and run the election. Or different like in, in France, that Macron decided to run and created the structure to run easily. So today in Brazil, after colors, adventure, the system, the establishment of Brazil create a lot of locks to impede uh, people, new people to arrive and get a, the, the, a coalition and run in a strong condition. So for sure, what will boost the chances of Bolsonaro will be the social media, for sure. But the others will use also. And I'm sure that after uh, 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 the, the successful pre-campaign of Bolsonaro, and, and that's very important to understand, Brazil is going to have a very short campaign, but is having a very long pre-campaign. So we are in campaign since uh, June, July last year. So with this in mind, so people know that what they are doing. So I believe that uh, the other candidates will, will also use the same resources and the same technology to impair the success of, 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 of Bolsonaro. But for sure, I, I agree with you, social media will be key for this election. Uh, the, the, and, and also the, 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 the desire for a renovation, uh, for sure. Uh, but uh, in the end of the day, this election is the election of dep uh, deputados, senators, governors. So how the, this desire of renovation can express, be expressed in voting? How? If the candidate of Novo in Brasilia is an unknown guy, or in... Mato Grosso or in Bahia. So people just say, no, no, I'm going to vote for a Partido Novo because they are anti-establishment. I think that this is not so far so strong in Brazil. Monica, do you want to comment? Hope you guys are right. <laughs> yeah, just, just one, um, one point that's related to comments made by both Mauricio and Murilo. Um, related to the what we what we can expect from the campaign itself um, in view of their comments and Brazil is a place where normally and we saw this in 2014 you know you go into a presidential campaign and you actually have no policy discussions at all um, it's basically you know people just um, throwing stuff at one another and in view of what this this the outlook for this for these elections are in view of candidates like bolsonaro who are firebrands and you know they may have chicago boys with them but they're they're populists at heart um and ciro gomez as well who have this tendency to do this kind of thing. What I fear is that we are going to have, in spite of everything, we're going to have a campaign that is devoid of policy discussions completely. So, you know, a lot of the things that we heard today, a lot of the very good things that we heard today from Governor Alkimin are not actually the things that are going to be discussed in the campaign. And when you're looking at a campaign with, a, with probably a very large rejection rate, with a lot of no votes, with a lot of blank votes, you're going to elect a candidate with a very small margin who's not really going to have a mandate to do anything because these things are not going to have been discussed during the campaign. So this is an issue to think about and really reflect upon as we go into this. And I just wanted to mention it because we haven't talked about it. 
Do we have questions from the audience? Yes. If you can please uh, wait for the mic and then uh, announce your name so everyone Peter knows Haken, who you are. Peter uh, the Inter-American Dialogue. Murillo, you made the point, uh, and I agree with, that the law is pretty strong about preventing Lula from running. Uh, on the other hand, I presume uh, the Supreme Court will take account somewhat the political consequences of their decision, at least in two ways uh, I, I'd like to ask you about and anybody else want to. The first is uh, if Lula begins to rise in the polls, moves up to 40, 45 percent of the vote, and you know Bolsonaro moves up, and you begin to see this, and uh, do you think that that will affect the way the Supreme Court makes a judgment? Uh, what will happen to the institutionality, the politics of Brazil, to deny people the right to vote for somebody who has sort of more than 40 percent of the first round vote? Uh, secondly, I presume that the Supreme Court and the other courts are interested in their own uh, legitimacy and credibility. And if the narrative that Lula is trying to implant, that he's the victim, that he's being attacked by a corrupt legislature and all, begins to pick up steam and begins to become a critical narrative, and does that affect the, the choices, the decision of the Supreme Court? Uh, Peter, I uh, totally agree that uh, the Supreme Court will be influenced by the environment, especially because Lula uh, is Lula. He's a, a successful president uh, and owner of a very powerful narrative. And his uh, movements has a, a very important impact in society. But I do not believe that the Supreme Court in Brazil will uh, reject uh, the previous decisions in relation to Lula. Uh, and why? First of all, because uh, the majority of the Supreme Court today uh, agrees with the decision. So there are few people there that will tend to. I believe that the decisions in relation to Lula will be more related if he will be arrested or not, but not reverting the decisions uh, under uh, what happened in the, uh, with Moro and uh, with the TRF4 in Porto Alegre, the second level. So the Supreme Court will, be, uh, s uh, will feel the pressure, but so far everybody was, uh, since the impeachment, the, the leftists in Brazil were, are promising to create a confusion in the institutional scenario. They said that they will paralyze Brazil because of the impeachment, they said they will paralyze Brazil if Lula is is will be start to be judged. They will seize the, the court in Curitiba or in Porto Alegre. And nothing happened, you know, because they lost traction. They, he, they, he still has popularity, but it's not anymore a mobilized popularity. Uh, this is something very interesting. His, mo his popularity is not driven people to go to the streets to shout and protest in favor of him. And people, are, and people are aware about that. So I do not believe uh, the Supreme Court will be shy to, to confirm all the decisions in relation to Lula, even knowing the problem. I believe that they are concerned about arresting, because arresting can create, you know, a, a, a jurisprudence <laughs> of arresting a president is something very, very serious. And they, are, they have doubts about that, you know. We have doubts if a president needs needs to be arrested, you know, it, this will be, they, they will break a paradig paradigm with this. Okay, uh, just one thing that I read in the newspapers today, I don't know the validity of that, but uh, it looks like the Supreme Court will analyze uh, the case of Mr. Bolsonaro in a uh, statement he made in chambers about uh, raping a member of uh, that chamber, a congresswoman from the Workers' Party, and he could be declared ineligible because of that. This is this morning's, I don't know if that is, has any 
you know, viability, but oh, there's a common feature between Ciro, Lula, and Bolsonaro. They talk too much, and this is very dangerous. <laughs> well, one know, has one has to hope one has to hope that the Me Too movement arrives in Brazil in time to deal with. Yes, this. because this is you know being an apologist of torture, an apologist of rape. Uh, it's uh, very serious. So. That believe me, there are some Brazilians that uh, would like to see the Supreme Court step in and make that decision. Uh, so, and then Mr. Bolsonaro will have to run s in some other place. Uh, questions? Dr. Elso Santana, where's the mic? And then there. Trice. Uh, Elso Santana, professor at uh, School of Foreign Service, Georgetown. My question is, is a different angle, which is the following. Um, the organized crime in Brazil has been involved with the electoral process for a long time. And Brazil is not the only country that has suffered that. I mean, some other also. But anyway, uh, we, we have recently, not so recently, but uh, 400 kilos of cocaine on a senator helicopter, and nobody talks about that anymore. We had uh, 54 million of reais in cash in one of another senator's uh, apartment. So there, there are some signs. I mean, there, there is nothing really uh, proved or obvious, but, uh, but there are some signs. My question is, given the campaign financing constraints that we have now, what's the role of organized crime that organized crime could have in the financing of the next election? Okay. Uh, who wants to take that, Ricardo? It's, uh, it's difficult to answer this question. I think uh, I, we can comment on that. It's, it's, it's the best way to approach. But uh, it is a fact, I think. Our understanding is that there will be uh, organized crime will have more influence than they possibly had previously, given the fact that they will continue to be willing to sponsor campaigns, even though it's not allowed by the legislation. So um, we'll see. We'll see a lot of that. On the other hand, I think the the power of law in Brazil, it's much stronger now than it was, um, say, in previous elections. Okay, I think after the Lava Jato, a lot has changed in Brazil. I think they're a lot more aware. They're a lot more. They're being a lot more careful how they deal with illicit funds. So one thing tends to kind of balance the other. Okay. Do so you mind if I just speak? yeah, yeah go for just it, yeah, yeah um, just two things I think. And <coughs> also relates to uh, Governor Alckmin. I think we have a new factor in, 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 in Brazil called the PCC and the fact that organized crime became much more organized in recent years. And But my concern is not that much at the national level, but rather at the local level. And, you know, we had cases in Sao Paulo, for instance, where you had you know, PCC vereadores voting on, on uh, specific things and from different parties. So it's certainly a problem and, and, and a problem that Latin America as a whole faces and speaks to the failure of the drug, the war on drugs as a whole, well, another topic that will not be discussed uh, during this campaign. Um, yeah, I think. Uh, Murilo. Yes, it's important to understand that we have many levels of organized crime in Brazil. The first one was uh, dismantled by Lava Jato, you know, which was the relationship between contractors, politicians, and, be co be, uh, and the government and state-owned companies. So this was a sort of, uh, not a sort, it's organized crime to dope the political system and to change the results through the power of the money, through, through, through the power of corruption. But the presence of the crime related to drugs and others, uh, misbehaviors, are more in municipal level in Brazil because they tend to control communities and they want to have <laughs> freedom in their communities to operate. So I do not see uh, uh, this 
structures uh, organized to influence the federal uh, election in the sense that they have a bench there, like the evangelicals, like the agribusiness, you know, supporting the crime or acting to protect the crime. They, they, I believe they will work independently. They have relationship, but actually the connection or the interconnection between the Congress and uh, uh, the organized crime is very weak because the Congress has not, this is not in the agenda of the Congress. Some, from time to time they do an ad hoc committee to debate, but the problem of the crime is not the Congress. The problem of the crime is the, is the local delegado, the deputy of the city, the judge of the city, uh, the military police of the city, because they want to have freedom to operate. And they don't have uh, the, the ideology to work in an organized manner in political terms. They are becoming more organized now, uh, but not in the sense that they will uh, uh, finance uh, campaigns to have congressmen in Brasilia to protect the business. Uh, not, not, not yet. Okay, final question, the gentleman. There may be one, two. Okay. Oh, and no, he was first. Then. Yeah. Okay, one, two, three. Yeah. Yeah. You, Go, you yeah. and then you. Okay. Thank you, um, James Suzer with uh, Mitsui. Um, first off, uh, thank you to the Wilson Center for having a panel about Brazil that has five Brazilians. Um, that's the first I've seen at a think tank here in Washington, so thank you for that. And um, my question is, on, is also in regards to public safety and specifically to uh, Mr. Mora, since you do polling. Um, in the polling that EDEA has done, do you all examine uh, specifically the issue of public safety and which candidates are um, seen as most favorably on public safety in, in polling? Thank you. Um, there's a big issue. Uh, one of the reasons, even people that don't support Bolsonaro, that don't vote for Bolsonaro, that thinks that he has the best proposals that I, I don't know yet for, for public safety, for, for public security. So in our polls, Bolsonaro is leading that area, but it's still, it's true, I like People don't feel safe in São Paulo compared to 10 years ago. So if when we ask the question, do you feel São Paulo is safer? A strong majority feel that they are not safe as they, they used to be. So about perception is, is, is a, key, a key factor on, the, on public security. About Rio, we did a survey and 75% of the Cariocas, of the people from Rio, think that the security will be better with the intervention, but 80% think that it's not the real solution. And one thing that we did a poll in Pernambuco, the other state, and 71% they wanted a, a military intervention in the state of Pernambuco compared to the, to, to the same approach of Rio. So uh, as of today, uh, the can for the voters are not clear what are the proposals from, uh, from the, the other candidates. But, but uh, when I ask the voters, oh, what are the Bolsonaro's proposals actually? Because you're saying that's a good, even that, we have Lula voters that if Lula doesn't run, they vote for Bolsonaro, and I studied those, and they say that they are voting for Bolsonaro if Lula doesn't run because of the security. And um, and I ask, uh, what are the proposals that you're gonna that he's he's presenting that good for you? And mostly they say that Bolsonaro is proposing that the like a regular folks have firearms. So those are the things that are mentioned by the by the by the voters. So this is, but. It's true that they, they don't know what the other can they think about security and, and so on. Okay, we'll bring back the military by election. <laughs> That's what it sounds like. Question, please. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, if you can please ask your question. Oh, I'm sorry. You yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, Sebastian Mack from the George Washington University. My question is uh, for Monica. Um, it seems that the debate on, on the role and the size of the state hasn't only come knocking on Brazil's door, but on other countries in South America as well. Argentina, Colombia, I think, are going to have these similar, similar debates. And with the electoral cycle coming up, I was wondering how uh, any signals from, from – you mentioned that y this debate won't be very present at the Brazilian election. I was wondering if this could uh, put it off in the rest of the elections as well. Like, Is there an uh, interconnectedness in this debate? And 
on the reforms as well eventually will will there be a, will there be looking for signals you know if brazil is adjusting will it just is is that going to be a thing or or not thank you for your question can we get the second question and that will be it thank you i'll keep it very brief uh, ed verona with mcclarty associates and it's a question for any one of the panelists you've uh, talked up to now only about the inward dimension but is or will there be during this presidential campaign a foreign policy component? And, I'm, and I, I can think of several areas, but one very specific and pressing issue is Venezuela. Does that resonate at all uh, in, in, in this campaign or I in any sense in, in, in political discussion in Brazil? Um, so let me start. I'll, I'll try to address a, a bit both questions, but let me start with your question first. Um, so the reason why I think we are seeing the, this kind of you know, small state, big state discussion taking place in, 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 in all sorts of countries in Latin America, and in particular in those countries where elections are going to be happening, so Colombia is next, then Mexico, then Brazil, um, Costa Rica that is also going to be coming along very, very, very soon. Um, the reason why these things are coming up is corruption. So corruption is the underlying theme in common um, to all of these elections in all of these countries. So the big state, small state um, issue comes in where the state is seen as an agent for corruption and therefore you need to strip um, the state's ability to you know, engender or in, in some way support these corrupt practices. Apart from that, I think the discussion about small state, big state, then becomes very local and very particular to each country. So when you move away from the, from the corruption theme, then it becomes very specific to each country. In Brazil itself, that discussion has the corruption dimension to it, but it also has a strong ideological dimension to it. So it's sort of like the new conservative conservatism in Brazil, the new so-called right in Brazil that's rising. Um, and it's rising in Brazil for reasons that have to do with Brazil. It's rising in other place, places that reasons that have to do with other places. So I think that kind of debate is there in all of these countries because of the corruption theme. And then there are other things that come into play as well that are specific um, to each of these countries. Generally speaking, elections in Latin America, yeah, sometimes you know you see similar results happening in different countries in terms of who gets elected and from you know what side of the ideological spectrum they're from. But I don't expect any one election in the region to influence any other election in the region. So I certainly don't expect, for example, the Colombian elections to have any influence on the Mexican elections and the Mexican elections to have any influence on the Brazilian elections. I think it's you know each one is separate and each one has to be looked at separately. On your very important question about Venezuela, um, it certainly hasn't been an issue that anybody has brought up um, in, in, terms of, in terms of the candidates in Brazil. And I guess the reason is, you know, Brazil's big. The Venezuelan, at, at least the, the migration crisis part of Venezuela, as you know, isn't really seen by anyone. It's very localized in the, in the northern part of the country. Um, which is sparsely populated, by the way, and there aren't there are a lot of Venezuelans coming in, but you know it, it's hard to get to Brazil. It's easier for them to get to Colombia. So if I were to look at this issue, the the migration issue, um, from the perspective of Latin America as a whole, the influence is much bigger on the Colombian elections than on the Brazilian elections. If there if there's any influence on the Brazilian elections. Well. At the moment, Brazil hasn't taken that kind of position. We haven't seen that. We have seen governments manifesting themselves collectively or individually, but without any actual leadership pulling the region. That we have not seen. With the, only, the, only, the only, only thing that I see in the state of Roraima, that uh, Venezuelans are crossing the board, this is going to be a big issue for the state election there. That's the only sign that I have. But uh, there is one important factor here to be considered, is that the Brazilian federal government is kind of uh, dealing with the issue of the refugees that are coming. There are 50,000 who came in a state that has 500 
thousand people, so an increase of ten percent. But they are dispersing. The people come and they are sent to other cities, and this process has started to avoid precisely to prevent the start of. Brazil has always been, and I mean that the foreign minister has always been very attentive to avoid creating problems at the border. So they are starting to send people to Rio Grande do Sul, to Santa Catarina, to other states in Brazil to disperse the, the problem. Uh, one thing, I think there is one final question that would well be can can I really I must close, otherwise we're going to miss our lunch with the government. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry for extending this. My name is João Ricardo Pisani. I'm a student at uh, Georgetown University Master. Uh, it's a consensus for all of you that social media will have a considerable impact in this next election. And most of social, social media channels are establishing in foreign countries what represents a breach in the Brazilian sovereignty. Um, do you see the chance of foreign actors influencing the Brazilian election or any demonstrations of sharp power in this election? I'll, I'll, be one second. Yeah. I'll be very short. I think, I think so, yeah. I think we, uh, we've been having interesting discussions about this topic uh, here in the United States with the Southcom. People are very concerned about foreign interference in Latin Americans' elections. Specifically, uh, I'm not going to name the country here, but they specifically point to one country uh, where these uh, interferences are coming from. So we don't know exactly how that will play out, but it will be there. It will be there. And I think Brazilian authorities are aware of this. There are task forces to monitor this. They're trying to mm -hmm. neutralize the effect of that. But it will be present in the elections for sure. Uh, yes, for sure it will be. And it's important to know that uh, during the Chilean election, uh, the, the campaign of Pineda identified 55 IPs coming from Brazil, uh, promoting fake news uh, against him, against Pinheira. Uh, so uh, we have to worry about the question, not only from abroad, but also internally. Uh, uh, I just want to go back to the Venezuela point and about foreign policy in Brazil. Um, I don't think it will be an issue of the campaign. Foreign policy has never been an issue in Brazilian campaigns. There was a famous Ulysses Guimarães saying that, uh, it's a bit difficult to, to translate, Itamaraty não dá voto nem no Burundi. So it, it's, not g it's not relevant, um, and uh, the chancery is not with a politicized post, although we have a political ministry right now. Brazil, um, Brazilian foreign policy basically imploded under Dilma, and Brazil has been had a, fo a real foreign policy since then, and I think the political crisis has severely undermined Brazilian influence across Latin America. And one would expect that Brazil would take a lead in Venezuela, but I don't think the country has the resource right now, and it, it will not have the resources at, at least until um, you know mid-2019 if we elect a government that it's capable to put forward a coherent agenda and look again at foreign policy as a serious matter. Great. I want to thank our panelists for this very rich discussion. I want to thank all of you for coming. Thank you for your interest in Brazil. The Brazil Council, the Wilson Center, will continue to organize these debates along the year. It's looking like a very exciting year ahead. <laughs> Thank you all. Yeah.